All right, Chair and Council Members, we should be ready to go shortly. Are we ready, Mr. Chair? Are you ready? Ready whenever you are. Okay. Yes. Then we'll begin our uh, sergeant so we can start our recordings. Recording in progress. Okay. Recording in the chambers has begun. According to the cloud underway. Recording in the chambers underway. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to today's hybrid hearing of the New York City Council's Committee on Zoning and Franchises. Let's see. Uh, to minimize disruption, please turn on your video. I'm sorry. Please, of all panelists, please turn on your video. To minimize record, to minimize disruption, please uh, silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at uh, land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you very much. We are ready to begin, Mr. Chair, whenever you are. Good morning. And welcome to the first meeting of the subcommittee on of zoning and franchises of this session. I'm council member Kevin Riley, chair of the subcommittee, and I'm excited to get to work today on the first round of hearings with my fellow subcommittee members. Today, I'm joined remotely by Majority Leader Powers, council member Moya, council member Abreu, council member Hanks, council member Carr, council member Showman, council member Barron, and council member Lewis. Today, we will hold a public hearing on proposals for special permits for 415 Madison Avenue in Manhattan and a rezoning proposal for 749 Van Sindarin Avenue in Brooklyn. Before we begin, I recognize the subcommittee council to review the hearing procedures. Thank you, Chair Riley. I am Angelina Martinez Rubio, counsel to the subcommittee members of the public viewing Members of the public, sorry, wishing to testify were asked to register for today's hearings. If you wish to testify and have not already, already registered, we ask that you please do so now by visiting the New York City Council website at www.council.nyc.gov forward slash land use to sign up. Members of the public may also view a live stream broadcast of this meeting at the Council's website. As a technical note for the benefit of the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of any of the presentations shown today, please send an email request to um, land use testimony, one word, at council.nyc.gov. When called to testify, individuals appearing before the subcommittee will remain muted until recognized by the chair to speak. Applicant teams will be recognized as a group and called first, followed by members of the public. When the chair recognizes you, your microphone will be unmuted. Please take a moment to check your device and confirm that your mic is on before you begin speaking. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony you would like to submit instead of appearing here before the subcommittee, you may email it to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number and or project name in the subject line of your email. During the hearing, council members with questions appearing remotely should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of either your participant panel or the primary viewing window. Council members with questions will be announced in order as they raise their hands and Chair Riley will then recognize members to speak. Witnesses are requested to remain in the meeting until excused by the chair, as council members may have questions. Finally, there, are, there will be pauses over the course of this meeting for various technical reasons, and we ask that you please be patient as we work through any issues. Chair Riley will now continue with today's agenda items. Thank you, council. 
To begin today's meeting, I will now open a public hearing on pre-considered LU items under Europe number C210453 ZSM and, and C210454 ZSM relating to the 415 Madison Avenue proposal in Majority Leaders Powers District in Manhattan. This is, a, this is an application for two special permits, one to generate a floor area bonus for the provision of a public concourse at the ground floor of a proposed new office building, and two, a special permit to waive East Midtown height and setback rules and certain other sub-district requirements. These actions will facilitate a new commercial office building at the corner of Madison Avenue and East 48th Street. For anyone wishing to testify on this item, if you have not already done so, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the council's website at council.nyc.gov slash land use. I, will allow, I would now like to allow Majority Leader Powers to give any remarks about this project. Thank you. And first of all, a very big congratulations to my friend and my colleague and my, my uh, new chair, uh, Kevin Riley, who takes over one of the most important committees here in the city council, but also for the city of New York in, this, in the sense that it is all about the future of the city, the housing that we build, the ability to transform Midtown to do much more here in the city. And this is a really important part of the city council. I know that Chair Riley is going to do an absolute uh, great job with it. So congratulations to him and, of course, to all my new colleagues who are here and joining this committee for the first time. A very big congratulations and very excited to have you all here and also joining what is a very, very important part of the city council and a part of the future of the city. Uh, so uh, with that being said, I am the uh, city council member Keith Powers. I am the member overseeing this uh, project here at 415 Madison Avenue. And I just want to talk a few for a few minutes just about the project and also, of course, the importance of the East Midtown corridor and the rezoning. Um, for starters, um, this project itself is part of comes out of the East Midtown rezoning, which was passed a few years ago uh, under my predecessor, Dan Garodnik, who is now, as many of you know, the new chair of the City Planning Commission. Um, under that rezoning, they looked at the Midtown and wanted to transform East Midtown and its aging stock of buildings. Uh, and also at the same time makes significant investments in the transportation infrastructure that was uh, desperately needed in Midtown to add access points, to add new places like West Bay, bring in east side access and other uh, transportation to uh, Midtown to really keep it uh, vital and make it uh, to be a long lasting corridor here in the city for, for places where people can work and of course where so many people live as well. Um, this project in particular at uh, 415 Madison Avenue is probably the fifth or sixth project to come out of the East Midtown rezoning. Uh, it's more modest in many ways in size and scope compared to the other projects, but still provides important benefits to this area, including it's going to provide a uh, east side access. And I think the lot, one of the larger, uh, but also one of the most important east side access uh, access points for folks who work in Midtown. So for anybody who works there coming from Long Island or anybody who lives in the area and wants to use that as a way to get out to the island, it is going to be a critical access point in this building for the east side access that's being funded as part of this project. We're getting nearly $5 million in public realm improvement funding as well as part of this project to do sidewalk expansions, plazas, closed streets, you name it, uh, in this East Midtown area. Um, this project uh, has come forward um, and some of the special permits they're asking for will also allow for extra circulation space in this area so people, pedestrians can uh, more freely flow through the area and provide some changes to the actual size and shape of the building, which I think will be helpful. Um, it's also, while it's not a, it's not nearly the size of some of the other projects that comes forward, it's also another uh, additional piece of the puzzle when it comes to East Midtown for providing additional space to different types of tenants that are going to be located here. And also just represents an investment in an area that just really needs it right now. Uh, I'm, I just will say I'm supportive of the project. Uh, I have questions that we'll ask uh, throughout this, but generally uh, it's a straightforward project with a few uh, proposals here to make it better. Uh, and I think I want to thank the applicant who's here today for their work and their uh, honest engagement as we've had changes or needed to have questions with them as well. I think it's a good piece of the puzzle when it comes to investing in East Midtown. It'll provide millions of dollars, if not more, of um, uh, investments for access points and transportation here. So 
with that, I look forward to hearing their presentation. And of course, Chair Riley, thank you always for giving your my time your time to me. And thanks to all my colleagues as well for their consideration of the project. Thank you so much, Majority Leader Powers. Uh, we have just been joined by Council Member Botcher. Uh, Council, please call the first panel for this item. Chair Riley, and apologies to the council members. I think we're having some audio issues. issues. Um, um, the first, first panel, panel for this for item the, will be Nick Martin, Nick Martin Melanie, Melanie Myers, Myers Amy, Amy Carlo, Carlo Ellen, Ellen Lehman. Lehman. Council, please administer the affirmation. Applicants, can you please, please, please state, raise, raise your, your right your... hand and state your name for the record? Nick Martin, Food and Management. Melanie Myers, Free Frank. Ellen Lehman, Free Frank. Amy Garlock, SOM. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. Yeah. Thank you. When you're ready to present your slideshow, please say so. It will be displayed on the screen and slides will be advanced for you by our staff. For the benefit of the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of the presentation, please send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is land use testimony at council nyc.gov and now the applicant team may begin panelists as you begin i'll just ask you please reinstate your name and organization for the record you may begin great good morning everyone my name is nick martin senior vice president at rudin management company uh, and we're excited to be one of the first or the first project to present to this new subcommittee and, and council um, congratulations to Chair Riley and all the subcommittee members, um, and thank you, uh, Majority Leader Powers, for that intro. Uh, we've had the fortune of working with the council member on this project for the past two and a half years, so you know, thank you for making yourself available and you know your, your feedback that has helped make this a better project. Um, I'm joined today by Melanie Myers and Ellen Lehman from Freed Frank, um, and uh, Amy Garlock from SOM, who's our architect, um, to help present the project. So let's jump in. Uh, if you could please bring up the presentation. Is the council staff able to bring up the presentation? Uh, yes, Nick, just give us one second, okay? Sure. Okay, perfect, thank you. So here you'll see an initial rendering and we believe that 415 Madison is a thoughtfully and beautifully designed building that meets the many goals of the Midtown East rezoning that Majority Leader Powers was talking about in his intro. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. You'll see here that 415 Madison is centrally located uh, within the Greater East Midtown uh, District. Uh, it's on the Northeast corner of Madison Avenue and 48th Street uh, in blue. Next slide, please. A key factor in, in our design of the building was its connection to transportation. On this slide, you'll see its proximity to Grand Central Station um, and also the new East Side access. Um, the shaded uh, red area is the new east side access concourse, which is currently under construction and slated to open at the end of the year. And the red arrows on the left are a series of entrances that will run up Madison Avenue to provide additional access points to east side access to the north. Um, if you um, go to the next slide, Um, this is a zoomed in version, um, and you'll see on the left the entrances in relation to our building 415 Madison. 
Uh, it's important to note that this is the northernmost uh, entrance to east side access, and the MTA's projections um, show that roughly 25% of east side access users will be using this northernmost entrance. Um, so that just underscores the importance of having this be a very functional um, and well-designed entrance. Uh, on the right, you can also see in a bit more detail the connection to the east side access through the building. Uh, there's a series of escalators that lead down from the base of the building to the east side access concourse, and then a further escalator down to the LIRR mezzanine. Um, you can also, through the LIRR concourse, um, have access to the Metro North uh, train lines as well. Uh, and then the rendering on the bottom is from, on the bottom right, is from the MTA of that proposed LIRR concourse. Next slide, please. So in addition to the connection to transportation, we also look to improve the public realm by adding a distinctive public space along Madison Avenue. There are a series of publicly accessible spaces along the Madison Avenue corridor, seen here between 46th Street to the south and 51st Street to the north. Um, this, the block of 415 Madison between 48th and 49th is the only block without a publicly um, accessible space. It's also a particularly narrow stretch of Madison Avenue. And so we, we also thought about the public realm uh, and pedestrian uh, and just overall uh, usage from residents, um, workers, and commuters. Next slide, please. F finally, one of the key goals of the Midtown East rezoning was to update the aging office stock. You'll see the existing building shown here. It was the Rudin family's first commercial office building opening in 1955. And it's very emblematic of the aging office stock in East Midtown. Uh, it has low floor to ceiling heights and numerous interior columns. Next slide, please. And here you'll see some renderings of our proposed building to redevelop the site. It will be a state-of-the-art class A office building uh, the site is relatively modest at about 11,600 square feet. And so what this will produce is a boutique office building that we think will really add to the variety of office space in Midtown to cater to small and medium-sized big businesses. Um, as Councilman Powers noted, it's, it's different than the other types of projects that's, that have moved forward thus far under the East Midtown rezoning. Um, and we do think it will add diversity to the office stock that will be very important and which we believe there's demand for currently. Um, overall, we think it's a very unique and beautiful building that thoughtfully balances all of these competing demands, modern office space, connection, superior connections to transportation, uh, to east side access, and improving the public realm by adding distinctive public space along Madison Avenue. Uh, we were thrilled that Community Board 5, uh, both Land Use Committee and the full board, voted unanimous, unanimously in support. Um, and we also received positive recommendations from Borough President Brewer and the City Planning Commission. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Melanie Myers uh, from Freed Frank to run through our land use actions. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, uh, for having us this morning. My name is Melanie Myers. I'm with Freed Frank, Harris Shriver and Jacobson and we're land use counsel for the applicant. So the building that Nick spoke about and shown in these images utilizes a number of mechanisms that were adopted as part of the East Midtown zoning that are geared first to promoting modern new office space in place of some of the older building stock and second, to introduce publicly accessible spaces, which will enhance the broader East Midtown public realm. Next slide, please. Certain of these mechanisms are administrative certifications that have already occurred. And these include certifications that allow for 
the rebuilding of overbuilt floor area and the existing building and a transfer of development rights from a landmark building, in our case, St. Bart's Church. And with both cases, these um, certifications came with a contribution to the East Midtown Public Realm Improvement Fund. The remainder of the mechanisms that we we're proposing to use are the special permits that are before the council today, namely First, a special permit under zoning resolution section 81645. And this too is to allow for an additional three FAR on the site for the inclusion of an amenity known as a public concourse at the ground floor of the building. And second, a special permit under zoning resolution section 81685 to allow for modifications to the street wall, retail and heightened setback controls to allow for the introduction of the public concourse as well as for modulation of the building form. Next slide, please. As a result of these mechanisms, a 287,200 square foot, 24.6, FAR modern office building will be allowed, a public concourse will be provided, and approximately $4.7 million added to the East Midtown Public Realm Improvement Fund. Of this amount, the public concourse special permit will allow for 35,000 square feet of that floor area. The findings for a public concourse special permit focus on the prominence of the space, its contribution in relationship to pedestrian circulation in the vicinity, the amenities contained within the space, transparency and activation surrounding the space, and the way that the design of the concourse combines the separate elements within the space into a cohesive and harmonious plan. We believe that the public concourse proposed at 415 epitomizes the goal set forth in the special permit. And I would like to now turn it over to Amy Garlock of SOM to describe the design of the public concourse as well as the building as a whole. So thank you for your time and I'll turn it over to Amy. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Nick. And thank you council members for having us this morning. Um, you can advance to the next slide. My name is Amy Garlock. I'm an associate at Skidmore Owings and Merrill and we're the architects for this project. Um, very honored to present this project to you this morning. Um, and I'm going to speak first about the design of the concourse um, for the first special permit that Melanie mentioned. Um, and then I'll speak more generally about the design of the overall building and the two waivers for the second special permit. Um, starting though first with the design of the concourse itself and its relationship to the overall plan of the site. Um, we're looking here at a ground floor plan for this project on the northeast corner of East 48th Street and Madison Avenue. Um, and this site in the context of East Midtown is a relatively small site. It's only um, 11,674 square feet. And so there's a lot of competing demands for uh, the real estate space at the ground floor of this site. And we wanted to make sure all of the pieces of the puzzle work together um, absolutely seamlessly to have the best possible public experience at the ground floor of this building. In the yellow, you can see the access into the concourse for east side access. The escalators in the center of the plan uh, go down two levels to the east side access concourse. Um, and as Nick mentioned, this will be a very well used access point for the new east side access Long Island Railroad. Um, additionally, uh, the MTA has estimated that of the people using this east side access point, 95% of those customers will be heading to the north and west. If you advance to the next slide. And so when we were considering the placement of the public concourse, we really thought about how we could best open up the pedestrian experience on this south side of the site and enable people to more easily access um, points to the north and west. Uh, you can advance to the next slide, please. And so in the placement of the public concourse here on the most prominent corner of the site, it not only gives a really public identity to the building, but it also effectively doubles the pedestrian uh, walking space from the east side access concourse to the corner of 48th and Madison uh, from about 20 feet to uh, over 40 feet. 
And so the public concourse itself really enhances the pedestrian experience of that east side access point. The concourse itself, if you can advance to the next slide, please, um, really defines the ground floor of the building. And there is a lot of transparency both into the east side access concourse and into the lobby of the building. And this backdrop of a public space really wraps around the, the corner and becomes the identity of the building. And uh, you can see behind the frame of the building structure, um, a really generous amount of space. Um, and if you advance to the next slide, please. That um, from Madison Avenue, you can really see the enhanced visibility of the access to the transit um, and the, um, the identity of the building really stretching across the face of Madison Avenue uh, with prominent public art, transit access. Uh, and if you advance to the next slide, please, you can also see uh, the integration of retail in this public concourse space to activate it beyond uh, the transit use during the day. If you advance to the next slide, please. Uh, speaking about some of the actual detailed design um, of the concourse itself, we worked extensively uh, with uh, community board and with uh, council member and with uh, city planning to uh, refine the design of this concourse. And we incorporated many different kinds of seating. The concourse itself really is um, kind of divided into two key pieces. The southern portion is really about enhancing access to east side access and connection to transit, and so is left free of any fixed seating. Uh, the northern portion is more sheltered um, and is really a place to step out of the uh, path of the sidewalk and have a place for um, a quiet respite along Madison Avenue. Uh, we have four movable tables and 12 movable chairs, an integrated bench along the eastern wall, and two bases uh, for two artworks with integrated seating that uh, I'll talk about in a little bit more detail in the next couple slides. We also here in the darker purple, you can see there's a uh, grab and go type retail space uh, for a small coffee shop uh, or food establishment so that on the way to the train or while you're sitting um, in one of these different uh, places, you can have a place to get a bite to eat. If you advance to the next slide, the concourse itself uh, wraps around the corner. Can you please advance to the next slide? Thank you. Um, and so here you can see these two pieces of the concourse working together harmoniously with the retail point at its hinge. Um, the two artworks on the left side are defined by natural granite bases. Um, the artworks themselves are illustrative, but the organic open nature is the intention um, of this applicant team. And um, here you can also see the lively nature of the access to east side access uh, beyond. The material of the concourse itself are all natural warm materials that will be um, both durable and beautiful over the long term. We intend for this to be a bright, open and welcoming space at all times of day. Um, and if you can go back a few, it advanced a couple slides on its own. Just to pause here to say that uh, we've introduced thoughtful textures um, at the lower scale um, for the to enhance the human scale of the space. And um, these, the seating here, we intend to be reconfigurable um, to uh, be adaptable to many different kinds of uses for this space um, and different kinds of social gathering. If you go to the next slide, you can see the concourse in the context of the overall building. At the base of the building, um, the concourse is really prominently located on the corner. And this echoes the language of the rest of the building with pieces stepping gradually down to the street, bringing light and air and um, open green space down to the street as well um, as part of the identity of this building. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. She's going. 
and um, and then you can see at the base of the building, this openness really connects down to the street. Next slide, please. And the ability to have this openness and this stepping down at the corners um, requires a waiver to the height and setback regulations. And to demonstrate the degree to which we are requesting this waiver, we've put the proposed building on the left side of the screen um, and a building form that is not our proposal, but the building form on the right side does comply with the height and setback regulations for Greater East Midtown. Um, and in contrast to our proposal um, is actually taller and has a taller base as well. And so in order to um, enable the stepping at the base and um, to more regular, uh, enable more regular office floor plates at the top of the building. Our proposal um, trades off a little bit of uh, greater bulk at the corners, although it um, does end up being about 30 feet shorter than the complying proposal on the right. Um, but it, we think it also really improves the, um, the base of the building by stepping down at the corners and bringing more light and air to the street at those points. Um, it also, in order to enable the public concourse, if you advance to the next slide, please, we are requesting a waiver to the retail continuity and street wall requirements, which along Madison Avenue require uh, retail for 75% of the frontage and requires the street wall within 10 feet of the property line along the full frontage. And if you advance to the next slide, please, um, in order to enable the recess for the public concourse itself along Madison Avenue and to enable the lobby and public concourse uses along Madison Avenue, we are requesting a waiver to both the street wall continuity and retail requirements. If you go to the next slide, please, uh, there's a small diagram illustrating uh, the depth of the recess that requires the street wall continuity waiver and um, in the small text along Madison Avenue, you can see illustrated the small retail frontage from the interior retail uh, use within the concourse um, and the areas where we are requesting a waiver on either side. And if you go to the last slide, um, I just to summarize here, we really think this is a great project for East Midtown. Um, to echo my colleagues, this is a new kind of office space for Greater East Midtown. And uh, we think the public concourse and the east side access are going to be a real amenity to uh, this corner of East 48th and Madison Avenue. And we are happy to answer any questions from council members. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy, Melanie, and Nick. Uh, just a few questions. Now I'm going to turn it over to Majority Leader Powers. Um, on slide 21, I believe, I believe it was the one showing the alternative site massing. Could you just please confirm uh, that this is meant to illustrate height and setback compliance with respect to the daylight requirements? If not, could you please clarify? That is confirmed. You're correct. Okay. Regarding the open area, can you talk a bit more about whether and how this space meets some of the standard POPs requirements, such as seating and lighting, or if not based on those requirements, how did you arrive at the amount of proposed seating, for example? Uh, I'll start a little bit, and then Amy, if you want to follow mm -hmm. up. Um, so thank you for the question. The public concourse special permit was one of the elements of East Midtown that was introduced and I th in, a, in a manner to sort of provide some flexibility in terms of the types of spaces that can benefit the um, East Midtown. Um, it's not subject to the degree of sort of strict rules that you would see in a in a POPs, in, in for, for example, for a public plaza, which identifies the number of trees and the number of feet in, from a, in a very specific way. The public concourse special permit had sort of much broader, um, uh, more flexibility from a detail standpoint, but with a strong intent on making sure that the spaces sort of worked within the network that they're next to. 
Um, and so, and so we thought about it from from the standpoint of what elements work the best for this corner and this part of East Midtown, and how this element could move uh, and sort of add to the network as a whole. Um, and you know, so there are these two elements that we were able to achieve in a relatively small space. One was providing you know access to the east side access, which freed up, it, which not only facilitated access to East Midtown, but helped to facilitate and to free up the sidewalk surrounding the site. And we were able to sort of optimize the space, the, the remainder of the space from a seating and uh, amenity standpoint. So the calculations and the number of seats were worked out with, with city planning and the community and in our discussions with everyone. Um, but we were sort of started with the broad no notion of what would be the best for this corner um, from a public standpoint. Um, Amy, I don't know if you'd like to add. Yeah, just a, a little additional detail. Um, you know, we did work quite closely with city planning on the design and it takes a lot of the elements from the um, POPs regulations, which you may be familiar with, and integrates them into this plaza. So we have three different types of seating. For example, we have benches with backs, we have benches with no backs, we have movable tables and chairs, we have public artwork, we have um, some greenery, we have the retail corner activation, and all of those came through an iterative design process where we work directly with the city planning staff. Thank you, Amy. Uh, last question, what can you tell us about any sustainable design features or systems that will be incorporated into this project? Sure, so, you know, we are um, designing the building um, up, up to the, the highest sustainability standards. We're certainly looking at um, what will be required under Local Law 97 and other um, built environment sustainability bills. Um, you know, it's going to be a key key aspect in the design. Um, you know, Amy, I don't know if there's anything more specific um, as, as SOM is going through, um, you know, the detailed design that you can, can speak to. Uh, sh sure, I can just say a few things. We're absolutely committed to uh, reducing our carbon and um, to that point in this building, we are looking to minimize use of uh, material as much as possible. And also um, we're ha having the highest performing facade possible. Um, that really is key to energy savings. Um, you know, as Nick mentioned, we are uh, working to make sure that this building is um, not just complying with the New York Climate Mobilization Act, but going beyond. Um, and the design of the building itself is really thought of with, um, the access to greenery and outdoors and fresh air for all of the tenants. Um, and that's really key to how those small terraces are deployed at all the levels of the building. And if I could just add one more thing, one of the requirements for, these are, these are qualifying buildings under East Midtown, is actually a higher performance standard that's written into the zoning text. And we of course will be complying with those controls as well. Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to turn to Majority Leader Powers for some questions. Thank you. Thanks, Chair Riley. Um, I, I have most of my questions answered uh, today, but I just wanted to talk uh, first, just, a, just kind of like a broader question as we're going to be talking a lot about office space in the coming years, and we've seen a lot of projects coming through Midtown as we're tackling this sort of question of space. Why don't just talk a little bit about your building, um, how it fits into the conversation right now about sort of the future of Midtown and office space, uh, what one might expect in terms of whether we can, what occupancy may look like and some of the challenges here, because obviously it's a question confronting a lot of us right now is, you know, redeveloping, building new office space at a time where there's some fluctuation and expectations. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So you know, what we're seeing in the just starting kind of broad picture in the market right now is there is certainly a, a flight to quality you know, newer class A buildings. Um, and speaking of East Midtown, right, I think that's the foresight of, you know, the the, the council in, in passing that legislation was how do you modernize those office buildings? 
Um, and this is one case where right now we have essentially an obsolete, uncompetitive office building, particularly in this environment and what we've gone through the past, you know, two two years. Um, you know, there's very limited demand for it. Um, you know, the project that we're proposing, um, you know, I think does at least two things that I'm thinking of offhand, right? One is clearly, you know, that modern class A office building that's, that's designed as Amy was just talking about with everything that um, folks are looking for in terms of, of, of health and wellness and air quality, um, you know, co connection to, to greenery, outdoor space, you know, from um, the tenant's perspective, but also from the public realm perspective with the public concourse. Um, the, the second, which I talked a little bit about in the intro, the, I think what's unique about this project, particularly in East Midtown, is it, is, it, is, it will be a boutique office building. Um, the, the, the floor plates, um, you know, plus or minus, depending on where you are in the building, of, of 10,000 square feet are likely to attract, um, you know, tenants may take a floor, maybe two. And so what you're looking at there are smaller, medium-sized businesses um, as compared to some of the other larger full block buildings or, you know, one company um, redeveloping a site. Here you'll have a variety of, of, of office space that will bring in different types of companies and you'll have what we expect a building where each floor or every other floor will be a different company, um, you know, to add to that office stock. Got it. And just a, a, one one last question, and then I'm gonna uh, hand it back so we can move the agenda along. But is the construction timeline? Can you give us a sense of what the process and timeline will be from start of construction, demolition? I think you're starting demolition already, but gives us an, a, a sense of timeline here. Yep. So we we have largely completed interior demo. If you go by the site right now, um, you'll see um, um, the sidewalk shed um, and, um, and and other uh, materials to prepare the building for full for full demo. Um, we have not started full demo yet. We expect to shortly. Um, once we do, that will take approximately seven months. Once we're complete with demo um, from start of um, uh, foundations up to full occupancy is expected to take 50 months. Five zero, five zero, right? Five zero, yep. Okay, got it. Um, all right, I have most of my questions answered already, but um, appreciate you guys giving a presentation here. And thanks to Chair Riley uh, for your time and good luck with the rest of the hearing here today. Thank you, Majority Leader. I now would like to invite my colleagues to ask any questions if they have. If you have any questions for the applicant panel and are joining us remotely, uh, please use the raise hand button on the participant panel. Council, are there any council member questions? No council member with questions. There being no questions for this applicant panel, this panel is excused. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on 415 Madison Avenue proposal? We have one person to testify, and apologies for the feedback on the audio. For any member of the public here to testify, please note that witness will generally be called for called in panels of four. If you are a member of the public signed up to testify on the 415 Madison Avenue proposal, please stand by when you hear your name being called and prepare to speak when I when I be go, begin to call your name. Council? Uh, we have one member, Ryan. I'm trying to confirm. Um, Chair. I think, sorry, Chair Riley, we're still having okay. some feedback issues. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, so, so I think I just need to use a chamber's mic from now on. Um, looks like we have one speaker. Can somebody confirm whether we have Ryan, um, apologies if I mispronounce your name, Pukos on 
available to testify. Yes, yes. I'm here. Yes, Ryan's here. All right, so we just need um, the timer sergeants for Ryan. Yep, uh, he can start when he's ready. Okay, thank you. Good morning, uh, committee members and chair. Um, uh, my name is Ryan Pucos, and uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the Grand Central Partnership. Uh, the Grand Central Partnership is a business improvement district serving an approximately 70 square block area in Midtown East surrounding Grand Central Terminal. Um, as one of the world's largest bids serving a district with 73 million square feet of commercial, residential, and retail building space, our goal is to keep our Midtown East neighborhood clean, safe, and thriving. We believe that the redevelopment of 415 Madison Avenue supports this goal in several important ways. First, the redevelopment will unlock privately generated revenue that can be used to make transit upgrades. For example, the project will enable the creation of a new East 48th Street entrance to the Long Island Railroad Eastside Access Concourse. Importantly, this new northernmost entrance will provide improved visibility of Eastside Access along Madison Avenue will also increase pedestrian circulation space by doubling the width of the sidewalk on East 48th Street. Second, the redevelopment will enable improvements in the neighborhood's public realm, including creation of a covered seating area and retail kiosk area that provides respite for residents, workers, and visitors. Uh, the project will also contribute $4.7 million to the East Midtown Public Realm Improvement Fund to support other district-wide improvements. Finally, 415 Madison Avenue addresses a long-term challenge for our district by replacing aging commercial infrastructure with a modern, efficient, and sustainable Class A office building, one of the most critical goals of the 2017 Greater East Midtown Rezoning. The new building will help attract and retain world-class talent and businesses that seek new construction and flexible office space. For these reasons, we support the redevelopment of 415 Madison Avenue. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, for your testimony. Are there any other council members with questions for this panel? If you're joining us remotely, please indicate by using the raise hand button. There being no questions for this panel, this witness panel is now excused. Thank you. Chair Riley, I'm just trying to confirm whether we have any more witnesses for this item. No problem. No more members of the public signed up to testify, Chair Riley. Thank you, Council. There being no members of the public who wish to testify on pre-considered LU items under ULIP, member, ULIP numbers, excuse me, C210453, ZSM, and C210454, ZSM, for the 415 Madison Avenue proposal. The public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. I will, I will now open the public hearing on LU numbers three and four relating to the 749 Van Sinderen Avenue rezoning proposal in council member Barron's district in Brooklyn. The applicants seek a zoning amendment to change an M1-1 to C4411 I'm excuse me, C44L zoning district and a zoning text amendment to map out an MIH area to facilitate a new affordable housing development. Once again, for anyone wishing to testify on this item, if you have not already done so, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the council website at council.nyc.gov slash land use. I would like to allow council member Barron to give any brief remarks about this project. Councilmember Barron. Uh, thank you, Chair Riley, and congratulations on your ascension to the chair. I'm looking forward to a, a long, positive relationship with you. Uh, this project is uh, around affordable housing, and you know we always have to define what affordable is because um, it may be affordable in the minds of other people, but not to the AMI for our district. So we are in very, very positive talks with this project. It's moving in the right direction. There are a few things that still have to be settled and discussed, like the height and uh, some of the um, uh, affordable formulas in it is still under discussion, but this is moving in the right direction. We also want to hear more from people in our community. Uh, I think there's some overall support of the project, 
but we will shut it down and be totally supported once we resolve every little issue. And we'll get back to you, Chair, and the committee to let you know how those negotiations, uh, negotiates are going. But I, it's best to let the project speak for itself, and then I'll have some small remarks after they make their presentation. No problem, Councilman Barron. Thank you. Not small remarks, short remarks, because my remarks are always big. <laughs> <laughs> it's no problem, Councilman Barron. We're looking forward to your remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Council, can you please call the first panel for this item? The first panel for this item will be Frank St. Jack, Rachel Ehrlich, and available for Q&A, we have Jamie Weissman, Ron Schulman, Richard Bass, and I believe we're having trouble getting, um, oh, I, I see him now, Bishop Mitchell, Taylor. That's the whole panel. Council, can you please administer the affirmation? Applicant panel, can you please raise your right hand and state your name for the record? Frank St. Jock, Akerman LLP. Jamie Wise. Wise. Jamie Wiseman, applicant. Rachel Ehrlich, Gatner Architects. Ron Schulman, Best Development Group. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in your answers to all council member questions? I do. I do. Yes. I do. Thank you. When you are ready to present your slideshow, please say so. It will be displayed on the screen and the slides will be advanced for you by our staff. For the benefit of the viewing public, if you need accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now the applicant team may begin. Panelists, as you begin, I'll just ask you, please reinstate your name and organization for the record, and you may begin. Uh, thank you, Chair Riley. Uh, thank you, Council Member Barron and subcommittee members. Uh, good morning. My name is Frank St. Jock. Uh, I'm with Ackerman LLP. Uh, Ackerman is land use counsel for the project. Uh, I'm also joined in this presentation uh, with, by um, the project architect, Rachel Ehrlich, uh, an associate principal at Datner Architects. Uh, and as noted earlier, we have, we're joined by several members of the project team who will be available for questions after this presentation, including the applicant, Jamie Weissman. Uh, Ron Schulman of Best Development Group. Uh, he's our affordable housing consultant. Bishop Bishop Taylor and Richard Bass, who is also from Ackerman. Uh, next slide, please. We are here today, excuse me, to present an application for a zoning map amendment to change an existing M11 manufacturing district to a C44L. Uh, commercial zoning district and a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing or MIH area within the rezoning area. The purpose of these actions is to facilitate the redevelopment of 749 Vincent Avenue with a nine story mixed use building with approximately 119 income restricted dwelling units and ground floor local retail and community uh, space. Next slide, please. So on this slide, the map on the left shows the rezoning area uh, shaded in red, uh, which is located on the east side of Van Sinderen Avenue between Linden Boulevard to the south and New Lots Avenue to the north within an M11 zoning district, uh, which does not currently permit residential use. Uh, as shown on the map on the right, the applicant is proposing to establish a contextual C44L zoning district. The C44L zoning district has the same bulk controls as the adjacent R7A residential zoning district that is mapped directly to the north and extends northward across New Lots Avenue. The C44L zoning district uh, does, however, require a five foot setback along the property line in order to provide for a wider sidewalk and improved streetscape adjacent to the elevated uh, subway line. So that's the main difference between the uh, C44L and uh, which is designed to be used near elevated train lines and the R7A, which is mapped directly to the north. Uh, next slide, please. The land uses in the surrounding area are shown on this map. Uh, here you can see that there is mixed use multifamily development directly to the north and to the west, 
which is shaded in orange. And then there's also lower density residential in the surrounding R6 zoned areas, uh, and that's shown in yellow. Uh, the M11 district uh, is shaded in purple, um, and you can see that sort of cutting through the center of the screen that's mostly used for uh, railway infrastructure, including the elevated train line uh, that runs along Van Sindrin. Um, Van Sindrin Plaza, as a, uh, which was developed in around 2018, is located directly to the north of the rezoning area in that R7A district that I mentioned. It's a seven-story mixed residential and commercial building. Um, and Ebenezer Plaza, at least the first phase, uh, is located uh, directly to the west uh, in that R7A, R7D zoned uh, portion uh, across um, uh, the, the train tracks. The new lot subway station uh, serving the L line is located just to the north of the rezoning area at New Lots Avenue. Next slide, please. So these uh, photographs show the development site and you can see some of that elevated train infrastructure on the right upper uh, left-hand side of the screen. Uh, and the, you can see that Van Sinderen Avenue is a relatively narrow street. Next slide, please. The proposed rezoning would facilitate the development of a nine-story quality housing mixed-use building with approximately 119 dwelling units and just over 10,000 square feet of ground floor space for local retail and community use. The applicant is working with local nonprofit organization, Not Another Child, to provide space in the building. Other potential uses include daycare and medical offices. The unit distribution is shown here in the chart uh, on the bottom of the screen. And I'll go over to the affordability in the next two slides. I note that we uh, recently changed five uh, studios previously proposed uh, and have changed those into one bedroom units after our most recent discussion with Council Member Charles Barron. Um, next slide, please. So the applicant is seeking to develop the building under HPD's ELLA term sheet that targets extremely low and low income house households and includes a 15% set aside for formerly house, homeless households. This chart shows that all the units would be at or below 60% AMI. Uh, we just um, changed the, uh, the breakdown to remove uh, the highest income band, which was previously at 80% AMI, so that now all the units would be at 60% AMI or below. Um, with this uh, um, breakdown, 19 units are set aside for the formerly homeless, um, at 16% of AMI. And the unit breakdown and corresponding rents are shown for each income band. So that's 14 units at 27% AMI, 23 units at 37% AMI, 17 units at 47% AMI, and 45 units at 57% AMI. Uh, and as Council Member Barron noted, um, we look forward to hearing his uh, feedback on, on um, this most recent breakdown and uh, we can work with him to uh, ensure that the uh, he and his office are, are uh, pleased with the breakdown. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this chart shows the annual income ranges uh, for households at, at each of the proposed income bands by unit size. Um, so in the last slide, we noted that there's 19, unit, uh, 19 units at 16% AMI, and you can see uh, the income ranges um, uh, by bedroom type. Again, that's 14 units at 27% AMI, 23 at 37% AMI, uh, 17 uh, units at 47% AMI, and 45 at 50%, uh, 57% AMI. Um, I'll note again that the project's affordable housing consultant is here for, for questions after this presentation if needed. Uh, and I'll now turn it over to Rachel Ehrlich of Datner Architects for the final two slides of the presentation to discuss the design. Uh, next slide, please. I believe I've been unmuted. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you, Rachel. Okay, sorry about that. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rachel Ehrlich. I'm an associate principal at Datner Architects, and we're very excited to be part of this team proposing this rezoning for a contextual and much needed affordable family housing development with new ground floor uses to benefit the community. We have two illustrative renderings to share with you today. 
In this first one, we see a pedestrian view. We're looking roughly north along Van Senderen Ave towards New Lots Avenue. You can see the existing Van Senderen Plaza at the corner of Van Senderen and New Lots Ave. It's adjacent to the New Lots Avenue subway station. This illustrative massing shows a nine-story building with neighborhood retail and community facility space at the ground floor with eight floors of affordable family housing above. Here we see the residential lobby entrance in the foreground on the right side of the, the page. It's set back from the street to help distinguish the residential portion from the retail and community facility uses. And notably, because of the proposed rezoning, the entire building would be set back in a five feet from the property line, which widens the sidewalk, creates some breathing room along Van Sinderen, which as Frank noted, is a, is a narrow street. And it generates a more welcoming pedestrian experience and streetscape. You can see this creates room for street trees, as well as a planted area at the residential entrance. There are two colors of brick proposed to help articulate the massing and further distinguish between the ground floor uses. The building is proposed to have a highly insulated facade with brick cladding with some metal trim used at the windows. It will have high performance windows with a very high acoustical rating to limit sound transmission to the apartment units. And you'll note that there are no mechanical openings or louvers proposed for the heating, air conditioning and ventilation. All the units will have high efficiency electric heat pump heating and cooling. There will be no natural gas burned in the units for cooking or heating, which eliminates pollutants from gas stoves that exacerbate asthma and respiratory disease. In addition, the units will have a continuous supply of fresh filtered air that's piped into the living rooms and bedrooms and continuous exhaust from the kitchens and baths to maintain a high level of indoor air quality. With these high performance HVAC systems, there would be no need to open a window for fresh air. So the residents will have a high level of comfort and a healthy, fresh interior environment without noise and soot from the street and the train. Next slide, please. This is an aerial view looking sort of north, northeast with the elevated L train in the foreground and the existing and proposed mixed use residential developments you can see on the east side of Van Sinderen Avenue. In this view, you can see the two volumes of the illustrative massing. The two volumes are articulated as interlocking segments with contrasting materials. And there's a setback at the upper story. So levels eight and nine are slightly smaller setback floors. A solar voltaic pergola is proposed for the main roof to help the building be extremely energy efficient and reduce its offsite energy usage. Here you can see that the base of the building uh, picks up on the uh, with the existing Van Center and Plaza development and creates a contextual street wall that brings new uses and um, a, a lively presence to Van Center and Ave with eight levels of affordable family housing above. I'm happy to answer any questions about the design, the mass angle, or the performance of the building. Thank you, Rachel. Um, just a few questions that I'm going to turn it over to Council Member Barron. Uh, Council Member Barron did mention that there were two body, uh, auto body shops, uh, businesses that will be displaced or relocated. Um, was there any mutual agreement that you guys made with these two businesses as of yet? Um, so I'll, I'll take that question. Uh, the applicant is, is working with the, uh, those tenants on a relocation plan, um, they own, uh, the applicant uh, has other buildings in their portfolio located in manufacturing districts uh, where those businesses can be moved to. Okay, will they be very, will they be far away from where they are originally located right now? Um, I, I don't have that information in front of me, but we can we can certainly provide uh, more details um, as, as those agreements are reached. Thank you. Um, although this proposed development is 100% deeply affordable through the ELA term sheet, the application maps MIH option one 25% at 60 AMI and two 30% at 80 AMI. Are there any issues if the council were to modify to remove MIH option two? Uh, no, this this uh, building would, would qualify under um, either MIH option, um, if there's a preference to for MIH option one, which I, I understand that to be the case, uh, there would be no issues with, with removing MIH option one, or excuse me, with removing MIH option two. 
how quickly do you anticipate being able to close financing with HPD and begin construction? Is there any estimated completion date for the project? So our environmental analysis um, conservatively estimated uh, 2027 completion. Um, we would have to, uh, you know, work closely with with HPD. I understand their their pipeline is is quite long um, to get a, a a better answer. But I think you know moving forward with the uh, zoning changes is, is the first critical step, and then we can drill down with with HP on on timing. Okay, just one last question. Can you just uh, briefly go over the sustainability and the resiliency measures that are incorporated in the building design and construction, uh, such as uh, solar panels, wind turbines? Um, have you also considered building to passive house efficiency standards? Yeah, you know, I'm gonna let Rachel um, answer this question and she can provide a, 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 all the details in, with that. Thank you, Frank. The project is proposed as a passive house development, which means that it meets extremely high performance standards for energy efficiency and occupant comfort. So there, as I mentioned, there would be no natural gas burned in the units, which creates a very high level of indoor uh, air quality combined with the fresh filtered air and the continuous exhaust. The building would be highly insulated with high performance windows and high, high insulation. And so um, passive house buildings had been found to enhance resiliency because of, in the case of a power outage, uh, occupants would remain in indoors in uh, an insulated building. Um, they could shelter in place because the building is so insulated, it would stay cool inside in the summer and warm inside in the winter, which is a great byproduct of a passive house development. So the combination of a high performance envelope, um, high performance mechanical systems for heating, cooling, and ventilation, solar panels on the roof, um, taken together, create a healthy indoor environment, a very low energy uh, project, and uh, reduced greenhouse gas emissions uh, in line with the Climate Mobilization Act. I'll also add that the units are air sealed from each other. And so in this era of COVID, when we're concerned about ventilation and separation, these would be these units would be uh, have unitized ventilation, so they're not mixing ventilation between units, and there would be fresh filtered air at all times. So passive house uh, is a is a high standard of uh, performance, and it has many added uh, benefits for health and wellness as well. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I would like to allow Councilmember Barron to ask his questions or and give his remarks. Councilmember Barron. Well, thank you, Chair Riley. Starting right. time. You, Chair Riley, you asked the question that we still going to be negotiating and that level of affordability is that although it is 100% affordable, but we're concerned with the same issue that you raised. And I'm sure we'll get there. Uh, I like the extremely low income uh, pieces there because in a lot of projects, sometimes uh, we really confuse what affordability is for our neighborhoods. This one fits the income ban, but it still has to make some adjustments as you uh, sing, uh, stated in your remarks. Uh, it's moving in a positive direction. We're going to have another follow-up meeting. I'll get back to you. And I'm really concerned about the auto body shops because I hear that they say they work on things. I want to hear from them to see if, you know, how they're feeling about, and you ask a good place and where will they be replaced? Where will they be uh, in the community? So those are things that we are working on the height, we might want to stay at seven instead of the setback up to nine. We'll be talking more about that. Um, but this project is one of the things that we um, fight for in our beloved East New York community. It is 100% affordable as the income ban, as we work out the uh, higher end, we'll work that out. And then the greening of the project, the energy of the project, the passive housing stuff all fits. And then having uh, Bishop Taylor and other community um, people who are concerned about services in our community to be a part of that as well. So it's, it's looking good, but we have to look at how they're gonna deal with project labor agreements and how much union stuff is gonna be involved and community jobs and things of that nature. So. Uh, this project is headed in the right direction. I think we can probably iron out uh, any small details or important details, you know, before we get to the vote, and we'll get back to you on that. But these are the kinds of projects 
that we were bringing. And I noticed that not too much around it is going to be blocking anything from from anyone. We'll look at look at that too. If there's any uh, open space gardens or anything like that. So as it stands now, it's moving in the right direction, and we hope to put some uh, final touches on it uh, in the upcoming days. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. I'm very <laughs> impressed with the AMIs and the affordability of this building. Uh, I just started in the council last year, but this building is really going to benefit the community. Uh, I see it uh, benefiting a lot of members and being very affordable. And I know that you had a very, uh, uh, you and your wife had a lot of input into it. So I just want to continue to, to praise you upon uh, helping to lower the AMIs amongst affordability uh, within New York City. Uh, now I would like to invite my colleagues to ask any questions. I don't know if uh, anybody, uh, council, do we have any council member with questions? Apologies, Chair. Um, no questions from council members at this moment. There being no further questions, the applicant panel is excused. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on 749 Van Sideren Avenue proposal? Yes, we have two members of the public who signed up to testify. Uh, we have Orisa Napper Williams and Bishop Jeffrey White. Our first speaker will be Orisa Napper Williams. Starting time. Good morning. I'm Orisa Napper Williams, founder and executive director of Not Another Child. Um, I just want to voice it's not another child support of the 749 Van Sinderen project. Uh, this project. Miss Miss Williams, I believe you mute. You muted. Hold on one second. I'm Go sorry. ahead. No, it's all right. Go ahead. To have community members. To have community members to participate in our programs, um, which is. Uh, providing therapeutic support to families of homicide victims, which is a great need in the East New York community. And so I just wanted to come on and, and extend our support or outwardly extend our support of this project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Napper Williams. You're welcome. Council, are there any more members of the public who wish to testify on this project? Yes, we have one more member of the public. We have Bishop Jeffrey White. Starting time. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Victoria Cameron. I'll be reading on behalf of Bishop Jeffrey White today as he um, wasn't able to attend. Uh, my name is Bishop Jeffrey White and I am the senior pastor of the Greater Temple of Praise located just five minutes away from the proposed 749 Van Sinderen project. I speak today in support of this project because it will bring new housing an investment to an underserved community where many of the congregates I represent live. This rezoning will improve the quality of life for the whole community by replacing a rundown site with 100 plus new affordable housing units. In our community, affordable housing and access to quality living while making a modest wage is scarce. In Brooklyn, over 130,000 residents live in public housing that is run down, dilapidated and unsuitable for living. New housing is not a desire, but rather a need. We are in desperate need of permanently affordable housing options, and I fully support this project that will offer better housing solutions for our residents, children, and grandchildren. I strongly urge you to consider this project for approval and think of the 130,000 plus Brooklyn residents who live in NYCHA campuses. Thank you for your consideration. Sincerely, Bishop Jeffrey White. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Victoria, and thank you, Bishop White. Uh, Councilman Barron, do you have any questions for this panel? Yes, yes. I just wanted to say that I um, neglected to mention Napier Williams and Bishop uh, White. They are strong supporters in our community. Uh, Ms. Williams has been doing a fantastic job. We supported her over the years, and I'm glad that she's supportive of this project and Bishop White. I think it is an asset for our community, and it's good to have these uh, groups and individuals on board with this project. It'll definitely be an asset for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Barry. Council, uh, excuse me, Council, are there any Council members with questions for this panel? 
Uh, no council member with questions at this time for this panel. Thank you, council. There being no more questions for this panel, this witness panel is now excused. There being no members of the public who wish to testify on LU numbers three and four for the 749 Van Sindarin Avenue rezoning proposal, the public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. That concludes today's business. I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, subcommittee council, land use and other council staff, and the Sergeant of Arms for participating in today's meeting. This meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chairman.